Welcome and thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Jay Parsons, Professor and Farm and Ranch Management Specialist in the Center for Agricultural Profitability at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. You can always find an updated schedule, registration information, and an archive of all of our past webinars on our website at cap.unl.edu. That's cap.unl.edu. USDA Risk Management Agency recently released a new federally subsidized insurance product called Wean Calf Risk Protection. In our previous webinar, we reviewed the, how the product works, some reporting requirements, and, and some sample indemnity payouts. On January 15th, the RMA uh, released their projected prices for the 2024 product, along with premium rates by county for Nebraska, Colorado, South Dakota, and Texas, the four states the product is available in, in this pilot uh, year of 2024. This webinar will focus on reviewing these rates, potential strategies to consider, and trade-offs between different USDA RMA insurance products based on the chosen strategy. To present, we have Dr. Elliot Dennis, an assistant professor and livestock economist with our Center for Agricultural Profitability. Elliot has been with UNL in the Department of Agricultural Economics since 2019. His research often focuses on issues like this that are related to livestock producers and policymakers. So before I welcome uh, Elliot to the program, I'd like to just remind everybody that you can type in questions while Elliot is presenting by using the Q&A panel or the chat on your Zoom window. We will answer all the questions at the end during a Q&A session, uh, where you can also obviously submit questions uh, during that session too. But don't hesitate to type in M. Type those questions in as they come to mind during the presentation. So with that, I'd like to welcome Elliot, and uh, I'll just go ahead and uh, turn the floor over to you for your presentation. Thanks, Elliot. Yep. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. And does, uh, appreciate the introduction. And also, the, as a reminder that we did, this is kind of part two of the, the kind of our effort to educate individuals on wean calf risk protection. So I just wanted to kind of before we get into what actually USDA released and, and where we get that information is, is just review the product. Um, if you, As Jay mentioned, you can go and find the webinar. It's about an hour and 15 minutes that we, we put out in the beginning of January. We go over all the kind of the nitty gritty details on how the product works, where to find information, what's the reporting requirements. And that's probably the biggest issue or thing that we need to consider is just the reporting amount of information, both prior and before or during the product. So just as a reminder, this is a wean calf risk protection can be used as a yield protection against weaning weight or against a revenue protection. Uh, and it's only for up to weaning age and it's for calves that are born in the springtime. So if we have fall calves, those wouldn't be eligible. Um, and as mentioned, there's, there's th three different products, but two of them are pretty similar. We have yield protection. That's a function of uh, basically what is our total weaning weight. So if we have animals that die, that would be counted on basically that reduction in weaning weight. So it's not ne doesn't necessarily pay for death loss, but it accounts for it by um, by paying for uh, reduction in weaning weight. We also have revenue protection, and that's you know a combination of what's that. What's the harvest price going to be and also our total weaning weight? And then we have this kind of variation, which is called harvest uh, revenue protection with harvest price exclusion. Details on that are in the other webinar, just kind of providing a broad overview. So we have something to go off of. And as Jay mentioned, this is currently a pilot program. It's available in four states, but within every county, within each one of those states in Nebraska, Colorado and South Dakota are in what we call the North Central region. So the pricing, our regional pricing will be consistent across those three different states. Texas is in the South Central region. That's uh, currently the only state in that, uh, that region. Um, and so it completely reflects that information from Texas. And as, as Jay mentioned, this is a, a new program. It was announced last October um, and November. And really we, we began our first phase in December of last year, which was our price discovery. During that time, in, in the middle of that, we kind of reviewed that product and price discovery ended in January 15th. So this is, uh, we were able to get information about what they project the future price will be at weaning or 
in November. And then uh, also they released kind of premium rates and also uh, factors related to county-based yields. Um, as a reminder, this product, in order to sign up for this product, it ends the, uh, the 31st. So you have to make a basically a purchase decision. This is in uh, contrast to the other available products like Livestock Risk Protection or LRP, which can be a daily uh, decision. But similar to, let's say, Pasture Range and Forage, which has a set deadline in December, and also Annual Forage, which has a summer deadline. So let's talk about... <clears throat> Uh, where we're at right here, we talk about that price discovery and specifically, excuse me, what we found from the release of the data from USDA RMA. So we're talking about kind of where we're at between here, price discovery, and kind of what's that decision we need to make before the deadline passes. So the big thing I always like to start off with is where do we get this information? Uh, Jay and I are always really big on transparency. If we're showing you information, we want to show you where you can get this information. And also, if you're working with an insurance agent, know that they're getting their information from a certain location. It's all the same information, uh, and it doesn't change by insurance agent. And so if we kind of focus on uh, the this red box, we're talking about you know, where we're getting that information. Just type in USDA or rma.usda.gov, it will pull up this website. And if you click on this tools uh, tab, what you'll see is this, it will drop down into this information. If you click this actuarial information browser, if you click that, what you'll pull up is this. Uh, you will be able to put in information here, uh, the, the year that you wanna use, the product, and we're looking at wean calf, the commodity year. And specifically, I was uh, I pulled up the information for yield protection. And then we're in Nebraska. And I just selected a county, Adams County. So once you select all that information, obviously, if you're in a different state or you want to look at revenue protection, you can uh, access that information as well. And then you click view report. So if you click view report, this is what it will pull up. So once again, this is that primary information up here. It will, you know, remind you of the selections that you made. And then it has all these different tabs here. This is types and practices, the structure, the prices. This is our transitional yields or our county-based uh, weaning weights, historical time series. Kind of some key dates to remember about reporting. What are the rates? So that we're going to talk about those and prices. What are the subsidy factors? And so these would be, what's the subsidy rates? Um, and then any uh, special information that you need to be aware of. So the two things that we're going to focus, or three things we'll focus on are prices, uh, trans or T yields and rates, T yield being weaning weights, um, and it will provide this information for you. Oh, and as a reminder, we, we do post the slides. And so, um, you can go back and, and use them as a reference. So let's first look at what yields look like or, or weaning weights. And as I mentioned, these, uh, if you recall, these weaning weights are specific to each county. And so if we're in Adams County, Nebraska versus Thayer County, Nebraska, they're gonna have different uh, historical yields. And the reason why these yields are important is because that you can only be, uh, if you provide historical records, to your insurance agent, your the yield in order for it to be counted can be no more than 125% of that county's yield. You can still provide a record that is more than 125% of that yield, but it's capped at that 125. So this, basically what you're trying to do is build a production history that they can then essentially provide a rating on. So, just to show you that this these are different by county, so it is important to go on the website or work with your agent to actually find what those uh, what county you're in. And so I, what I did is I just pulled some representative counties throughout the state uh, and plotted what they look like from really 2001 to 2000. Um, and what you'll see here is that they do change quite a bit. And so. Uh, what we can do is we can say, look, if we're in a specific county, this is what the yields say it's gonna be. 
what's that maximum yield that I can actually get to? And that's what this is saying here. Uh, it's saying in Thayer County, for example, uh, they were projecting that uh, um, it would be about 550 pounds would be kind of that average yield. So if you're providing records and you're in Thayer County, uh, you can be at most 125% of that. And so if really this is, all this is just multiplying this line by 1.25 and you get the same shape, but a little bit higher rates. And so if you're trying to develop a production history and you're in Thayer County, that most your uh, your production records within a given year would have to be would match this line. And that's just kind of example here. This was provided by USDA RMA. I pulled that from that information browser that I showed you. And then this is the multiplication there. The gray bar represents the last 10 years of history. So if you didn't have any production records and you still wanted to use uh, wean calf risk protection, that's possible. Uh, your yield in that case, your 10 year average would be 550 pounds. So that would be kind of your base rate. Um, and at most, um, if you are maxing out and you're above every year, uh, at most you'd be 688 pounds. So most likely we're probably somewhere in between there. Okay, so let's go over a little bit on what those prices look like that USDA released. Um, and so as a, as a reminder, when we talk about price discovery, there's really two factors that happen in price discovery that have an impact upon prices and also rates. The first is uh, if we look at prices, uh, essentially what they do is they, between December 15th and January 15th, they look at the November futures contract and they basically gather daily prices. From those daily prices, they adjust it by regions. But this is what the futures market did if you're following the November futures contract. It essentially had a pretty steady upward course. And then if we look at what it's been like even since then, this is where we're at from uh, December 15th this is about the last day in January that was in the price discovery period. And even since then, the prices have continued to gone up, right? And so kind of steady upward, you can calculate what's, uh, or can calculate what's called a volatility factor. And essentially what this volatility is, it's a measure of how much price moves. Uh, when that number is really high, prices are moving a lot. When that number is low, prices aren't moving very much. And essentially what that volatility factor does uh, when that number is really high, premiums are more expensive. And when that volatility factor is really low, pre premiums or premium rates tend to be um, a little bit cheaper. So this is very similar to livestock risk protection in the sense if you follow and compare the, uh, the Ch Chicago Mercantile Exchange put options to, let's say, a livestock risk protection option at the same coverage price, when that CME is trading uh, uh you know, there's a lot of variation in that price within a given day. We'll see that prices or rates for um, LRP be really expensive that night. And so just kind of gives us an indication of kind of where we're pricing at. As I mentioned, we have these calculated uh, regions. So Colorado, Nebraska, South Dakota are all in this north central region. And so essentially they take this national price and they adjust it down to a regional level price using a regional adjustment factor. And then the same thing for the South Central region. It's important to note that it's the same across regions or it's, or it's different across regions, but it's the same within counties across within a region. So if that price adjustment factor for Thayer County, Nebraska is going to be the same price adjustment factor as it will be in Adams County, Nebraska. But Let's say uh, Arkansas, uh, Texas is, uh, is gonna be different than Thayer County. And that price adjustment factor is over here. And this helps us adjust for the price weight sign. So what is that projected price at a base 650 pound that they're projecting? For the North Central region, it's $2.69. And for the South Central region, it's $2.48. Once again, this is the base price given 650 pounds. They have the price weight slides and these adjustment factors. So if we're producing a, a calf lighter than that, that price, this projected price will go up. If we're producing a weaned calf that's lower than that, that price will go down. 
And so everything is subject to that price weight slide. And then it's uh, when we're thinking about that what price to use, it's also important to know that that price is directly tied to the insurance product that we actually take out. And so what we actually just calculated was this formulated producer projected price. That's where we're at in the production process. They basically take the national price, adjust to the region, given a, uh, a fixed weight, then we can calculate our projected price. Now, if we're using yield protection, that's important. All we have to do is figure out what's our uh, actual uh, approved weaning weight uh, after we go through the production cycle and that same producer projected price is used. Um, but for revenue protection and revenue protection with harvest price exclusion, it's a little bit different. And we actually have to wait till October and figure out what happens during the uh, November futures contract in the month of October. And so if you're using that, know that this is just one portion of the, of the process. Uh, and we go into detail about how those products work and, and uh, what to look for in the previous webinar. So a question when I was talking with producers that um, they asked me and said, okay, well, we know we have this harvest price uh, or sorry, not, not the harvest price, the producer projected price. And we know that it's projecting in November well, how often and, and how, you know, what is that percent likelihood that what we observe during December 15th to November or January 15th will be similar to, to what we observe it in November. And so that's what I did. I wouldn't gather the last 30 years of futures, uh, futures information and looked at what was that uh, trading or average price that we observed in uh, from December 15th to January 15th and how that related to um, the November price. And essentially what this shows is that about 19 years out of the 30, about 32 or 32 or 33 years, it was actually uh, positive. And it, for an average price of the, um, the October price or November price is generally about 4% higher than this December 15th to January 15th price. So that provides some information if we're gonna take out this product, that yes, prices might be a little bit higher in November. So we're taking a little production discount uh, to actually fix a price today than expected a future price in the future. So let's talk about what are some of these uh, premiums and how the premiums are calculated and how it gets determined by the actual percent coverage level that you use. So once again, let's stick with Thayer County. Uh, and let's say we're in, we have that 650 pound approved yield. We provided our records. We, uh, we, we had great weaning weights and we're expecting the, this year we're expecting 50 calves and we have 100% ownership of those animals. So we're not doing any uh, cow share. And then these are the choices that as producers we have to make. We have a 65, we can choose anywhere between 50% coverage level and 85% coverage level. So those are choices. If we use yield protection, there's actually a, another um, policy called catastrophic insurance, um, which is allows, covers less than 50%. That's a only specific to yield protection. And then Specific also to yield protection, we, we have to talk about what's this projected price election. So we actually have these, these choices we have to make. Which insurance product we want to use, what's the coverage level, and then uh, what's our price election. So if we're saying our approved yield that we predict that we're going to have that we're covering is 650 pounds, and we want to cover 65% of that, our production guarantee is 423 pounds. And then at that price, uh, when we calculate all this liability, 50, 50 head at 423 at 269, then uh, this is what our total liability would be about 57,000. And if we look out on a per head basis, it's uh, $1,138. So as I mentioned, you can actually do price election. So you can say, I don't want 
uh, I want to use yield protection at 65%, but I don't want to have 100% of that 269. Essentially, what this does is it, it uh, cheapens up the price. And so this is, uh, it does vary by region. And so I went ahead and plotted what those prices would be for you. So if we're at 269 right here, that's 100% of that price selection. You can come all the way down here and say, no, I want only 70% of that or 70% of that 269. Um, and then it will adjust down and adjust down your premium. So you do have to make this uh, price selection. So for simplicity, we just talk about 100% of that price selection, but know that you can basically go anywhere along this curve and it does vary by the region that you're in. So, okay, so let's talk about what it looks like for those premiums. Important thing to note that this is a federally subsidized product, which means that uh, the subsidy rates are similar to other crop insurance rates or subsidy levels. And so pulling it from USDA website, this would be our coverage level. If you're at 65%, uh, coverage level where essentially the subsidy is about 60% of the, of the total premium that you would need to pay. Right? And so what I did is I just said, okay, let's just focus on, so we don't have to worry about kind of that uh, coverage level or coverage price. Let's just look at the revenue protection, revenue protection with harvest price exclusion. So once again, our premium there, when we calculate all this information is $1,138. And so USDA has a, a pretty uh, complex formula to figure out <clears throat> by county, uh, given your uh, adjusted rate and using some basically adjustment factors and simulated loss um, and standard deviation on those losses that are calculated, it comes up with a premium rate uh, for this example that we used in Thayer County, uh, for that 650 pound uh, adjusted rate, our total premium on that was $12 for harvest price and $10 for harvest price or revenue protection with harvest price exclusion. And so that's our total premium, uh, but the federal government does subsidize that. And so that subsidy amount in our case at 65% coverage level was seven dollars and so what do we actually pay as producers well we pay 12 minus 7 which is 5 and then given we're trying to uh ensure 650 pounds that's about uh about a little less than a, a dollar per hundred weight so that's our our kind of calculation there harvest price or revenue protection with harvest price exclusion is a little bit cheaper and that's because if we remember back on the uh, the way that it's priced, uh, we don't actually get certain options there. So that reduces kind of the total premium amount. Right? So of course we made, if you've been following, we, we made some pretty strong assumptions here, right? First, we've said that we've, we know our county that we're in. Uh, we know kind of our, our approved yield. And we've also made uh, basically a choice about our coverage level. And so if we're thinking about uh, that kind of production system, one thing we have to consider is, are those animals going to stay in that county the entire year? If the answer is yes, what we'll show you is, um, is kind of what it is. However, if those cattle are going to move to another county, this complicates uh, kind of the calculation we're not going to show that here, but if that is the case, you do need to talk to your insurance agent before you take out the product. So this would be an example of you maybe wean in one area, but you graze in another. And essentially what that what happens is that you actually have to pay the premium for the higher level county. And so you want to make sure that if you're kind of penciling this out and what the cost is and the benefit that you know and you communicate what your production system is to your uh, insurance agent. So let's talk about what is this coverage level. So I went ahead and just said, okay, if we're at 65%, what does this look like if we're at um, at different levels? What is that premium cost? And what is that relative benefit, right? And so this is what I did here. We'll just kind of walk through it kind of, you know, section by section. 
And so going from left to right on top, this is our coverage level. So here we were at 65%. Uh, and this is our first panel here, these first three lines um, is the revenue price, revenue price with or revenue protection and revenue protection with harvest price exclusion. And so you can look at what is that premium? So we're at 65%. And as a standard, most or the product is rated at 65%. And then it has adjustments down and it has adjustments up. You can see that uh, it's not what we call symmetrical, which means that if you go down, the reduction in premium is not the same as if you go from that same percentage up. So the way that works is if you go from 65 to 55%, you get a $4 uh, discount on your uh, premium. But if you go that same 10% from 19 to five, it's $14. So there's a, as we start to go higher up in those levels, it does get more, um, get expensive and it gets more, exp it gets expensive at a faster rate. And the same kind of goes for uh, revenue protection with harvest price exclusion. And so if we're looking at what does this looks like on a per hundred weight on that 6.5, we can just basically take these numbers and divide by uh, 6.5 um, to get kind of our producer premiums by hundred weight. And then what I tried to do here is just kind of put it in kind of that perspective on, okay, how much more are we actually paying per head? And if we go from 65, which was our base that we were at, and we want to go all the way up to 85%, we're basically paying 60, or we are paying $66 more per head. Um, and this is just, once again, just going through kind of those steps that we did for one example for 65 and saying, what if we did this over many different coverage levels? So the coverage level does matter. And so figuring out and saying, okay, what, at what coverage level or where do I actually need the protection? And if I'm figuring out what is my cost of production and how do I match up cost of production with uh, the actual number of um, products that are uh, insurance level that I need, this can help you kind of choose that coverage level. Where is it really going to hurt? Where do I actually need the money? At what, at what percent of reduction in weaning weight? And then if you look at what that's, what's kind of what we call a, a multiplier. We basically take 65 as our base and we say, okay, I know it's $66 more, but what's that uh, multiplier? It's essentially 13 times more expensive to go from 65 to 85%. So it does get expensive. And so just making sure you're aware of, you know, why you're choosing higher coverage levels. This is a, let's say maybe a little bit different scenario than what we've typically observed in insurance products. And so uh, what I'll specifically mention is livestock risk protection. I went and uh, looked at the last seven years of data that USDA RMA provides for people in Nebraska that have taken out livestock risk protection. And if you remember, livestock risk protection generally varies from about you know 75% of that coverage level price to 100, almost 100%, nearly 100%, 99.8. And when we look at producer decisions, what we find is that about 97% of producers chose a coverage level between 95 and 100%. And so kind of the default there was always to say, okay, let's just ensure at that higher coverage level, yes, there's a little lower premium, but I want that price essentially. So kind of put that as kind of a word of caution out there that this is um, with LRP, the premiums, you know, aren't quite as the multiplier on it doesn't go up quite as large as uh, we see on revenue protection um, and revenue protection with harvest price exclusion. So really important that if you're going to do this um, to pencil it out and understand kind of what actually is that break even point for me, given my, um, kind of expected weaning weights uh, that I need to actually go down in order to just to cover my premium. And then anything beyond that, I get paid out in indemnity. Right. And so 
<clears throat> what we talked about is that that there are these producer rates and we get, have to pay a premium. But it's also important to remember that there are fees associated with doing these products. So if you will go on and, and look and do this co cost estimators, which I did here for you, uh, what you'll see is this is for that example in Thayer County. And that's that same premium right there, that, sub, that $7. This is your producer premium there. And notice that it says no admin fee included. All right, so there are some fees included with this. Uh, those are fixed fees. So obviously this is per, per one head. And so as the more head you insure, the, the lower per head administrative fee cost it is. But in total, you'd have to pay $35. So it's not one head go in there, it's $5. It's, you do have to pay the admin fee. So just be aware of that, that there is that fee on top of that. And that's for the person to conduct all of the work. So, so total premium that you actually have to pay is the producer premium and the, and the fee. Um, one thing to note, as we mentioned in the other one, is that this producer premium is not due at signup. That was, you know, is also similar to the recent changes to livestock risk protection as well as, as, well as PRF that that premium is due at the end. And so essentially what happens is at the end, you get basically a, a payout. Um, you know, if your weeding weight dropped and that's great, uh, but if not, then you'll receive a bill and, and you'll pay that. So let's look at some of these, what are these potential strategies and, and ways that we're thinking, you know, what are, what are I can actually benefit from that? I basically provide uh, three different strategies that you should consider. Uh, the first is this tends to be a more favorable if it's underweight. So there's, when I say more favorable, it's less discounts than what we normally observe. Uh, but it also penalizes more if you're overweight. And this is because there is a, a linear price slide uh, adjustment factor from 650 pounds. And when what, what we observe actually for Nebraska in particular and generally is consistent across um, feeder cattle markets is that there tends to be a much steeper discount at lighter weights and a uh, basically a smaller discount at heavier weights. With a fixed kind of price weight slide, what that would suggest is that you, you're not getting discounted as much um, at the lighter weights, but over discounted um, at heavier weights. So that's something to consider kind of where you're at and where you're expecting to be at that if we're really producing over, then uh, there are a little bit greater discounts than what we'd normally observe in the market. The second is that if you remember from the, uh, the first webinar, we talked that at weaning, you have to basically give 72 hour notice that you're gonna start weaning. And then if you're gonna be weaning and weighing at the same time, it's feasible to do that. Someone has to be out there and observing the weights and selecting the cattle. The insurance provider uh, is able to do that or a legal representative of the insurance agent. However, if that's not possible, you're able to actually continue to background them and sell them at a later date prior to um, that January the following year. Um, and then they essentially use a fixed background adjustment factor. And that background adjustment factor is 1.5. So they basically take what your, if you background them and then you sell them or you weigh them after backgrounding um, and they take that weight uh, minus or 1.5 times the number of days from when you sold them and when you said you weaned and then they basically adjust back to your, um, yeah, basically adjust back to what they believe is your weaning weight. So this has a big impact. So if you're thinking about where we're at, if we're on a slow growth ration, which uh, maybe uh, we're putting them on corn stocks, but we're not, you know, heavily, heavily supplementing, uh, we have the potential and in some cases to be at about, you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 average daily or uh, average daily gain. And so at, after a slow growth, you could, potentially be, um, you know, not meeting that 1.5. And so it, it would essentially say that you actually weaned at lower, lighter weights than you actually were actually weaned at. So that's an important consideration of 
are you actually going to meet that 1.5 or is it going to be heavier or are you going to be lighter than that? And the, and the same would be true if, if you're really on an aggressive ration for a, a fast growth through the winter and you're more than 1.5, like kind of some work out of ammo science, you can come out at 2, 2.2 2 uh, if you're on a really aggressive ration with distiller's grains. Um, then what it would say is that you actually weaned at higher weights. So it's important to know and kind of talk about that with your agent of kind of where you're going to be at so that essentially those weaning weights are trying to be as representative as possible. And then the, the, the third thing we need to consider is that uh, um, wean calf risk protection, since it is a federally subsidized product, does not allow you to use other federally subsidized products to protect price risk or yield risk. Uh, the only product that's out there that does that currently is livestock risk protection. It's a price product and essentially sets, sets a floor price. So if you're using livestock, uh, if you desire to use livestock risk protection, you are unable to use wean calf risk protection. So know that if you're using wean calf risk protection, once again, you can't use livestock risk protection on those cattle until the product ends. If you're choosing to retain the cattle, and background them and do all this other stuff. Our understanding is that you are still able to use livestock crisp protection, but the product has to end before you're able to take out the new product. Um, but however, that doesn't ex um, exclude you from using futures or options for, at CME. Uh, so you can still use different types of uh, price risk managed, but they're just not federally subsidized. Uh, I pointed out because there's a I'd say a growing body of understanding on how to incorporate traditional crop insurance with say with say with like a corn soybean rotation with futures and options hedging and option strategy. And so while this is a new product for us, there is a body of literature out there that we could draw from. Um, and as I've talked with some producers uh, who actually have kind of a mixed cow calf corn operation. Uh, there, there is some familiarity with that. Now, how that all interacts and our understanding of that's still limited because obviously the product just came out, but there is some opportunity to, to do some additional price risk management. Okay, so just in conclusion, just some key reminders that uh, as I was kind of putting this together and things that I thought about were just more information that you can share with your insurance provider, the better. Because there's a since it is a new product, um, there's a lot of details that can really kind of hit, provide hiccups to, you know, the implementation of the product. Um, and so, just let's just go through some of what those that I think are just some key things to remember. First is that uh, you can take out the insurance, but the insurance doesn't attach to your animals until you actually report your first calf born. So once again, you have. Uh, February 1st all the way to January or July 31st to report calving. And so when calving begins, you have 72 hours to report that first calf and then insurance can, can begin. And then going leading into the second point, you have 60 days from the time that first animal is born uh, to essentially calve, um, calve out. Any calves that are born post that 60 day window are uninsured or are not sured insured through the product, but still need to be reported to your insurance agent. I already mentioned the cattle moving across county lines or count in even more extreme uh, cattle moving out of state or country. That would be probably, it's more specific to the Texas region, but it does have an impact on the total premium that you pay. So you do need to have that conversation with your insurance provider. And then Kind of the last is that um, if you're going to be changing management plans, that needs to be communicated to your insurance provider. So if you remember in the last webinar, we talked about uh, kind of these pre-entrance forms that you, you need to fill out. And so um, if you fill out the information, <clears throat> it's going to talk about what you're using for disease prevention, fly control, uh, a lot, you know, feed, water, if you're supplementing, can your pasture, you know, carry the capacity that you're at. So any changes to that, uh, once insurance begins, needs to be communicated and approved. 
Um, and so don't get in a situation where maybe you change something and it, it was for the betterment of the animals or the, the grass, but it wasn't approved. And then uh, when they come out and to adjust and let's say there was a loss and they see that changes are different and then that contract becomes null and void because it wasn't prior approved. So just make sure that if we are changing things from and we have kind of unique structures and every producer is different um, and that's fine. Let's just provide that information. I would encourage you just to communicate that with your insurance provider. And the last is that uh, since this is a, a pretty new product, there is still a lot of information out there that's being generated. We're in, uh, trying to be in communication with the RMA to get our questions answered. We're doing the best that we can. But of course, if there's comments, suggestions, or things that you're running into, we want to hear about that um, so that we can help educate other producers. Uh, and kind of allow for a greater understanding on, on these federally insured products. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jay. Thanks, Elliot. Good stuff. And read my mind with that last comment. We're all learning together on this. So. <laughs> no, no experts yet on this product. So we're interested in hearing those questions. So we did have three questions come in while you were talking, which we'll entertain here. And once again, if, if people have questions, you can uh, type them into the Q and a um, icon on your, uh, on your uh, Zoom browser there or in the chat, either one. Um, but the first question is kind of where you left off with those management plans. And uh, the question was, can you dry lot heifers and second calf cows with their calves instead of on pat putting them on pasture and still take out this insurance? So mm -hmm. is there any requirements that they have to be going out to pasture? That's a, that's a really good question. Everything that I have seen has been kind of pasture based. Um, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. That's a, that's a really good question. I'll, I'll have to get with RMA to talk about that. From what I've read is it's a, it's primarily a, a pasture product. Um, so it's not necessarily for dry lotting throughout the year. Um, uh, now backgrounding is a little bit different, but, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that I will, I will find that out. Okay, very good. And and like you said, you know, they definitely need to communicate with their insurance person and make sure things are yeah. approved or, uh, it, or if it's a change, right? If they end yeah. up putting them out to pasture and then bring them in. Yep. yep. And there's reasons why we'd want to do that, right? You know, if we're in a drought situation, but, uh, or it's just, maybe it's a management strategy that we have, but um, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. There's a good point here that it doesn't matter if you're doing this for heifers or steers or, you know, any any type of cattle you have um, that, you know, there is just one weaning weight. There's not like LRP where there's a weaning weight for heifers and I'm doing this for steers. And so we might have different management strategies. The reason why I'm bringing this up, we might have different management strategies for our heifers as we would for our steers, which there's good reasons for that. Uh, but that needs to be communicated because when we change those management strategies for the individuals, then um, then it could affect the way the product's priced. So, okay. And we had a question on how that uh, T yield works. If they don't have any records for the previous four years, but they have been calving during the last four years, uh, what percentage of the T yield would they receive? Okay. So um, if I understand that question correctly, saying you don't have any yields for the last um yes. you don't have any let's say we have eight years mm -hmm. i think is what it is uh and we have records for what have been calving during the last four years. Yeah, you don't they, have any records but they have been calving okay yeah so what if you don't have any ver third party verified records as essentially how they tried to find an uninterested third party is how they'd say it is that you would essentially use the county based yields. So if you don't have the information, that's okay. Uh, but essentially you have to use four to 10 years of county based yields. Um, and so you actually have to stick with these. So it would be in this case for Thayer County, if you're in Thayer County, you'd be using that 555, 549, 546 kind of values. So you'd be 
pretty close to that 550 amount. Mm -hmm. So that the reason why um, when we talk about, when I think about this product, the thing that I think about is records, 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 um, information, 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 because uh, a lot of this relies upon third party verified information and uh, it needs to be verifiable. So, yeah. And so that's a, you know, who can verify those things Yeah, in terms of that? Is that, can you run them across a scale? I guess some of the different restrictions on. Yep. So we, we did talk about this in, in the last webinar. There is a list of about 10 individuals that, uh, I, 10 categories of individuals that can approve these. Uh, essentially what happens is at weaning, you have to give, 72 hour notice to your insurance agent that you're going to be weaning. They essentially uh, are the ones who oversee the actual wit or weighing process. And they get to choose the amount of animals uh, that are weighed. And so if you're thinking, you think about just like, there could be a low distribution of weight within a pen of animals. It could be a high distribution. And so if they see, a lot of high distribution, they can weigh as many animals as they want. Uh, but essentially, it's the an agent or a, the a representative agent. So that could be someone like a state vet. It could be here's putting them through the sale barn. Uh, that's an approved weight. An extension agent could come out and weigh them. But this isn't uh, the producer saying, I want this person and I'm going to weigh this many animals and this is my weight. It doesn't, doesn't work like that. The insurance agent essentially uh, comes out or them or an, uh, an approved person comes out, chooses the number of animals to weigh, um, and, and weighs them. So, so in a sales situation in particular, do, do they have to get it approved ahead of time? Cause, or can I, they just take them to the sale barn and just present that receipt to the insurance or do you know? Yeah. My understanding reading through the documents is that the, the, AIP or the insurance provider essentially has to give the okay. And if it's going to a sale barn, there should be no reason why it shouldn't be okay, but they kind of get the final say on if it's an approved method or not. Okay. Yeah. And that's important because once they're sold and gone, you're, yes. you're not going to be able to capture those weights. And that's why they talk about 72 hour notice. It's 72 hour notice before weaning so that they can be there if you are going to weigh. Uh, and they're thinking about weighing or if you're going to sell and giving kind of seven to our notice so that they can verify that information. Really, really key. And that's why I say when I think about this product, I'm thinking, uh, you know, information, information and communication, communication is really important. So finding a, an agent that you feel comfortable with, that you're willing to communicate with um, and don't have any issues with because you're going to have to be talking with them a lot throughout this throughout this process. Hey, just a reminder to everybody, they got basically a week to decide on this. Is that right? It's uh, yep. next uh, Wednesday, the 31st, correct? 31st, so, so next uh, next Wednesday. So about eight days. There is a, an approval process. So choosing to the 31st might be a little bit late. Because <laughs> uh, from what I understand, it is possible, but it's just difficult. Um, and there is kind of a... Not everything needs to be, I guess, fully fully verified because they can come out after the 31st and look at basically ensure that every information that you provided on your pre-acceptance worksheet is valid. So if you say, this is my pasture and this is how many cows I have and this is where the water is, uh, they go out there and they say, yep, it looks like you have that many cows and you, you said the water was where it was and, you know, so... There is a verification process prior to the product actually taking effect. So, okay. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in. We really appreciate your presentation, Elliot, and we appreciate everybody's uh, taking the time to join us today and ask such good questions. And as Elliot said, uh, that you know this is something that we're all going to be learning on uh, the ins and outs and how things actually function with the program. This is a pilot year for it, uh, so we really. I uh, encourage people to reach out to us, not just if they have questions, but just stories to share. Uh, we appreciate uh, 
knowing how things are going from folks uh, anytime that we can get those those firsthand accounts and and understand things better. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and, and um, we'll uh, look at signing off here. Uh, just a reminder to everybody that this was recorded along with all of our webinars. Uh, they can be uh, found in our archive section of our Center for Ag Profitability webinar page, which is cap.unl.edu slash webinars. Uh, when you exit Zoom today, you also get a short survey. We really appreciate uh, the quick feedback that you have on today's webinars. In particular, any ideas or uh, for topics or speakers that could possibly uh, uh, be the subject of future webinars that we offer. We really want to make these uh, useful to uh, to producers out there and, uh, and to our audience um, overall. So thanks again for joining us. Everybody have a good afternoon and uh, wishing you all the best.